I think low carb is an easy starting place because you have something like the food pyramid, which is the epitome of mainstream health advice. And to have the perspective that is so opposite of that leads you to question where things are coming from and how many other thought processes are falling to the same fault. Whether we're fasting and relying on coffee on an empty stomach or we're just avoiding the carbohydrates, we get much more glucagon, adrenaline, and cortisol. And this is also where some people have an objection. They say, well, if you measure the metabolic rate, it doesn't decrease. And that's true, at least initially it doesn't, but that's because the proportion of it that was driven by stress has increased. Anything that happens in our life, there's gonna be some level of stress, but that doesn't mean that the stress is what accounts for the benefits. And that's the idea behind hormesis. And I would say it's actually a very, very dangerous idea. There is a whole school of thought, of course, still that talks about reducing metabolism. Within a species, the ones with the higher metabolic rates actually live longer, have less rate of oxygen species, and have less unsaturated membranes. It's basically the exact opposite of what we were told based on the rate of living there. Hey, it's Elwin Robinson here, creator of this, the Rejuvenate podcast, as well as Genetic Insights and Feel Younger. Uh, before we get into anything else, just want to remind you, please, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, like, and comment. And if you're listening anywhere else, then please review us on uh, platforms like Spotify and uh, Apple. It really helps us to get the word out there. So as you probably know, this podcast is all about bringing you cutting edge strategies to rejuvenate, hence the name of the podcast. And rejuvenate means to make young again. And, you know, feeling younger and reversing premature aging is really the focus, uh, the thing that I'm most passionate about teaching about. And so I'm very excited today to have a guest who I've been a, a big fan of for a while. He, I actually first discovered him because I have this uh, analytics platform and it said that um, I shared more subscribers, YouTube subscribers with this uh, channel than any other. And so I started looking into his work and I was very pleasantly surprised at how good it was. Jay Feldman, who we're having on today, I would say is the my favorite person who i found who's kind of ray pete inspired who i would say although he has an extremely large breadth of knowledge as you'll discover in this um platform i would say goes the most in-depth specifically on the dietary recommendations and i have to say i'm really glad that i had him on he helped to clarify a couple of points that i was actually unclear about uh ray pete's approach so that was very good or the bioenergetic approach i kind of say ray pete's just because there's another type of bioenergetics that I also recommend, created by Alexander Lorin. I think he actually uh, used the name first, but I guess a bunch of people have used it throughout uh, time. And so anyway, I was very happy to have Jay on. Usually when I have someone on, it's to focus on a specific topic that I really want to go deep um, into with them. But in this case, uh, I actually just had a, a bunch of different questions, a bunch of different um, topics that I was interested in from the Ray Pete world that are all, you know, uh, controversial, but I think potentially very valid and helpful. And so I went through a lot of those with Jay, not all of them. I've asked him if he'll do a pod, uh, part two. And um, I guess the more positive feedback we get, the more likely he is to do that. So please, uh, you know, like and comment and all the rest of it and share with your friends. Uh, but yeah, it, this was very interesting. As always, I encourage you to keep an open mind. Jay is sharing a specific perspective. It's, you know, a very different perspective from some of our other guests. Um, and so remember, if I have someone on, it's not necessarily because I 100% endorse everything that they say. It's just that I would like to bring them on because they, you know, first of all, I don't know if I'm right about everything, right? So I'd like to bring people on who have a new uh, or different approach to things that's kind of different from what you've probably heard from everyone else. Uh, which nonetheless has, you know, potentially is valid and accurate and helpful and could even be life changing. And Jay is definitely uh, one of those people. I would also say he has an extremely in depth knowledge and he shares it very well. There's another reason why I like Jay, but I'll talk about that at the end of the episode in the outro because I don't want to like um, uh, say it until afterwards. I want to see if you agree with me or not. But uh, yeah, uh, I was a big fan of this one. Just to remind you as well to always, you know, do your own research. Ultimately, any changes you make to your diet and lifestyle and stuff like that should always, you know, be run by a healthcare professional. But at the very least, remember, you know, ultimately you're responsible for your own actions and everything that you do. And so, you know, if you're going to make any changes, then always make sure that they are right for you. Uh, one of the reasons why I got so into genetic testing is because I realized that 
there are many reasons why different advice is helpful for different people, but one of them is definitely genetic factors, you know? So the whole argument is carbs, are carbs good for you or not? Is saturated fat good for you or not? All those kind of things, you know, one of the main differences that it depends on is actually the genes, which is why I create Genetic Insights, geneticinsights.co. Um, but, you know, there are other factors. And so we talk about some of those in this episode. So again, I really enjoyed filming this. I f definitely think it's worth paying attention to. Uh, listening all the way through it may even be worth like a re-listen because it's quite dense of information to really make sure you got all of it so without further ado let's get to it hey in today's episode i'm very excited to be joined by jay feldman uh, he is a health coach uh, a health researcher and the creator of the energy balance podcast and his energy balance course uh, welcome jay thanks for having me Elman. happy to be here yeah i'm really excited to have you here today um we're going to talk a lot about the bioenergetic perspective to things because I feel like you do a really good job of uh, explaining that in, in great detail. And I'm very excited to ask some questions, which I've received from some people since I did a, a video on Re Ray Pete's work because I that was meant to just be an introductory introduction to Ray Pete's work. I don't claim to be an expert on any, or anything, so I'm very happy to have someone on who uh, you know really is an expert on it. But just before we get into my questions, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background? I know you've been into this stuff for a very long time. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my interest in health began very young. You know, I was maybe 12, 13 years old. And at that point, it was fitness oriented. You know, I was an athlete and wanted to put on muscle in the gym and wanted to figure out the best way to do that. And that involved reading books and looking up information online and finding a lot of conflicting information but testing different things, a lot of different diets along the way. I was vegetarian for a while and then into the you know, paleo camp and intermittent fasting, doing cyclical, cyclical ketogenic diets. Uh, that kind of brought me through, you know, my teenage years. And then as I was in college and I was pre-med, so I was studying to become a medical doctor and I was low carb at the time. And on one hand, of course, recognizing the areas where conventional modern medicine falls short and listening to all these alternative ideas and all these things that weren't even being discussed uh, or weren't even considered to be a conversation in my classes. And that led to me challenging things, questioning things quite a bit. And around that time, I was also, again, really into ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, trying to improve my own health, resolve some, some health issues, but also just be optimal. That was really the goal. And I wasn't experiencing the things that I felt like were promised based on how intensely I was doing everything. You know, I was doing everything right to a T. And a lot, around that time, I came across basically the bioenergetic view of health, this idea that the energy that we produce in terms of the mitochondria in our cell, normally we call that ATP, the idea that that is what contributes to health and a lack of which causes degeneration. And so that kind of flipped things on, on its head for me. And it took me quite a long time before I was really, before I was really ready to kind of make any changes based on that. I spent quite a long time learning about it, trying to understand it and, and then doing some testing and experimentation. Eventually, you know, that was about 10 years back. And so as I started to make those changes, I noticed some things that I had been dealing with for my entire life went away and resolved. And not only the way that I felt physically, what were those things, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I mean, so the the thing that was most lifelong uh, of an issue for me was my relationship with weight and food and eating, under eating, that kind of thing. So I really intensely wanted to have, you know, perfect sculpted body kind of thing, put on muscle and have the six pack, six pack abs and all of that. And I did what I was told to do for a long time, which was just eat less and, you know, work out harder and all of that. And, you know, that, that was something that was always going on in my life. And along with that was this relationship with food that revolved around restriction, this feeling that I couldn't trust what my body was telling me. Of course, I would want to eat everything that's bad for me. And so part of life is just not doing that, right? It's constantly in that fight, eating the things that are maybe okay, but really fighting against all of those desires in order to maintain health. And that was the same thing for me on low carbon keto, even though I'd increased my calories at that point, it was still this idea of, of course, always wanting to eat carbohydrates, but this idea that the, uh, you know, that's obviously poison, that's a toxin. 
And our bodies don't want that or, or our bodies want that despite the fact that it's actually not good for them. So that was one of the biggest things was this recognition that those signals weren't actually something to fight against and instead they're actually there for a reason and that by listening to them in the right way, I could actually live in much better balance. I could actually not be constantly hungry, not be constantly fighting against restriction and cravings and things like that. So that was the biggest one. Throughout my low carb days, I'd also been dealing with some trouble sleeping, focus wasn't as good, libido wasn't as good as it should have been, especially considering my age, some things like that that had cropped up and and those also turned around for sure when I started to make some of these shifts. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And and so that was very exciting. It felt a lot better. I mean, it just, you know, of course felt right, made a lot of sense. And that was about 10 years ago. And then from then on, as I was separating from the kind of mainstream medical approach and path, I decided to work with people as a, as a coach and help people basically accomplish the same things and resolve all sorts of chronic health issues and feel a lot better using a bioenergetic approach. And so that's brought me to, to now. And what led you to drop the mainstream medical approach? Well, so being in the alternative nutrition health world, right, low carb and it's, I think low carb is an easy starting place because you have something like the food pyramid, which is at least in the States, like the epitome of mainstream health advice, you know, or mainstream diet advice. And to have the, this perspective that is so opposite of that and this recognition of all the flaws within that leads you to question where things are coming from and how many other suggestions, how many other thought processes are falling uh, to the same fault. How many of those are are basically going along those same thought processes. And so that was kind of the start of that. And then, you know, recognizing that the standard approach for medical practitioners is, or, or you know, mainstream medical doctors, is to treat symptoms with medications. And there's a place for symptom management, potentially. Well, there generally is. And there's also a place for acute care, of course. And there's a place for medications. But it wasn't a system that was oriented toward actually improving health. It was more managing health, so to speak. And that was something that didn't really appeal to me when I recognized how much we were, how much the things that we do in our environment, internal and external, affect our health and well being and everything from high blood pressure to autoimmune conditions to insomnia. So I wanted to, you know, focus on that and help people actually improve their health as opposed to working on managing symptoms with, with mostly medication. Awesome. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, when did you first discover Ray Pete's work? How many years ago was it now? Yeah, so that was right around 10 years ago. I was a sophomore in college, yeah. And you've been applying it ever since? Yeah. Yeah, so and again, it was a tiptoeing in of, of I mean, even, even early on, uh, it was a long time before I was ready to bring carbohydrates back in. And when I did... They were all glucose based, distilled a strong fear of fructose, as we often do from the low carb camp. And over time, you know, things shifted and morphed. And as I worked and helped other people, you know, the nuance evolved and the understanding deepened. And spent quite a few years after college very deep in in research. Uh, and you know, it's kind of been a the journey. Okay. And would you say that are there any major areas where you diverge, where your opinion diverges from the kind of repeat biodiotic approach or not really? I would say in terms of principles, not not really. But in terms of application, there's quite a few. You know, I think the deepest principles of Ray were things like anti-authoritarianism, perceive, think, and act, those kinds of things, which I think are things that I feel very strongly or very intensely congruent with. And then on the physiological side, I think the basis of energy and structure being interdependent and being the the driver of our health makes a lot of sense. I think those sorts of ideas I agree with a lot. When it then comes to what do we do to accomplish that, I think there's more ways than not that I definitely align, but there's some things that I, I do differently, I guess I would say. And, and I think what would def- where there's definitely a big separation is between what is coined a repeat diet or what a lot of people come away with after looking at a repeat for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months, that I think is very different from often what, what Ray was really about and then often as well with the way I would approach it. 
It reminds me a little bit of uh, Timothy Leary. His uh, kind of f slogan at the time was "Think for yourself, question authority," and <laughs> I think there's a little bit of an element of that with uh, Ray Pete's fundamental philosophy, which I definitely like. Um, well, that's awesome. Okay, so I just said that to clarify at the outset that when I ask you all the questions I'm going to now, you're sharing your perspective, not necessarily Ray Pete's, right, or the bioenergetic one. But yeah, so my first question is actually about weight. It's something I've never struggled with being overweight. Um, you said you haven't, but you kind of struggled to make sure that you weren't overweight, right? You wanted to be as, as lean and, and, and cut as possible. Um, so I had a question a little while ago in my comments uh, about the repeat video, and I answered it, but I said this is my best guess because I'm not an expert in this system. I don't understand it as well. So I'd like to ask you this question. So my understanding, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the bioenergetic philosophy is that things like insulin resistance which is the root cause of uh, a lot of different health problems these days you know it's quite popular to say maybe it's the root of all of the chronic health problems so it's a big deal the things like insulin resistance obviously the keto camp which you're very familiar with say that it's caused simply by too much glucose and then not enough exercise and fasting so that the glucose builds up too much your perspective on that is very different um and I guess it would be good for you. Well, uh, yeah, I know it is. I've seen your episode on this. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ha have you explain that a little bit. But then I also have a follow-up question. Uh, yeah, so let's yeah, let's hear your approach on that first, if that's okay. Then I have a follow-up question on it. Yeah. So I think the worst or the, the easiest way that people uh, get misled when it comes to insulin resistance is just comes from the name and the how it is categorized from the outset. So we have this idea that insulin resistance is a signaling issue where the cells, you know, when we're born, when we're young, when we're healthy, they respond really well to insulin, meaning that, you know, there's a response to insulin that allows for glucose uptake. And then we see in people who have insulin resistance, people who have diabetes, that this isn't happening and the, cell, the glucose is building up in the blood. And we've blamed this on a signaling issue where the cell has stopped responding effectively to insulin. And so we need more and more insulin to get the same effect until eventually it like kind of stops responding altogether or we stop producing insulin altogether. And that is an aspect of what goes on, but I would say it is an effect of the underlying issue as opposed to the issue itself. And so where I would point to as far as the underlying issue is that we have an issue metabolizing the glucose. So the glucose gets into the cells just fine and we actually see this in people of insulin resistance and diabetes, there's not really an uptake issue. It might take a bit more insulin, but the uptake is okay. Rather, there's an issue using the glucose once it's inside the cell. And that leads to a number of things. For one, it's going to lead to a low energy, high inflammation type state, high reactive oxygen species type state. It's also going to lead to a buildup of intermediates of glucose in the cell and glucose itself, which prevents more from coming in, even if our quote unquote response to insulin is fine. Even if the signaling cascade is working okay, we would have to work against this gradient and we have so much glucose in the cell that it, it can't effectively accept more. So I would say that's really at the crux of the problem. And then the question is, well, what is driving that state? What's preventing us from effectively oxidizing that glucose, converting it to energy? And I think that's the question we want to be asking. So in the low carb keto crowd, instead we're saying, Normally, we're not even identifying that as the issue, but even if we were, the feeling is, well, we're not using the glucose, so don't consume it. And that works to an extent in that it will lower blood sugar, it will lower insulin, you know, it'll lower A1C, and it can lead to some improvements in symptoms for a number of different reasons, but it's not actually solving the underlying issue of being able to metabolize or being unable to metabolize the glucose. And so that's where I would want to put my focus, and uh, that's what I would say the underlying issue in insulin resistance is. And as you were saying, this is universal, right? This is something that we see in any chronic health issue. You know, and that's why it's kind of coined as the major part of metabolic syndrome that's underlying aging and every degenerative state. And that's because our ability to effectively convert that glucose into energy, I would say, is one of the most, one of the most, maybe the most fundamental feature of our health is being able to produce energy from the fuel that's coming in. If we can't do it from glucose, we're forced to rely on something like fats, which works, but not quite as well. So, okay. So what stops us from utilizing glucose effectively? Uh, let's start with that. Yeah. So the, the fun part here is it's kind of everything. And so we can, we can look at, it's, it's something that we can, 
uses a lens through which to view any sort of interaction with something in our environment. And that can be anything from the types of fats we're consuming, right? The polyunsaturated fats are pretty good at at reducing the efficiency with which we convert glucose to energy. Different bacterial toxins, which we generally call endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, is very effective at doing it. Any sort of marker of oxidative stress, inflammation, stress hormones, those things will also interfere. We also have things like nutrient deficiencies that can prevent effective conversion from glucose to energy. We can have potential uh, heavy metal exposure that can pretty directly cause that sort of an effect. And a number of other things too, right? I mean, even just a generally stressful life, causing the increase of stress hormones will, will do the same and cause us to shift away from glucose burning. So it's a very sensitive uh, process. And so pretty much everything in our environment is going to affect it either positively or negatively, whether we're talking sunlight or sleep or the types of fats we consume or how many of certain nutrients we're getting. So I think what you said there is not controversial. The thing that I was expecting you to also say, which I hear a lot of talk about in the uh, bioenergetic world, is the issue of free fatty acids and the impact that they have. Uh, could you address that? Yeah, well, so there's what when we, as a next step, there are a couple of next steps that happen when we can't effectively oxidize the glucose. So me metabolically, what will happen is instead of converting that glucose through to pyruvate into the Krebs cycle through the electron transport chain, producing a lot of ATP, we convert it to lactate and the mitochondria start to use fatty acids for fuel. And they'll start to run the fatty acids through, well, through the acetyl-CoA, through the Krebs cycle, and then through the electron transport chain. That is considerably less efficient, produces much more reactive oxygen species, and due to a number of different feedback mechanisms, then prevents further uptake of glucose. So as a next layer here, first we can't oxidize the glucose, we have this buildup of glucose, we then shift toward fatty acids, which further prevent more uptake of, of glucose in the cell. And this is something that's, I would... I don't think so controversial, right? In, in that even in the low carb space, it's pretty well known that if you're on a ketogenic diet and you take an oral glucose tolerance test, it's not going to look very good. You're going to be very, very insulin resistant. And that's what's called physiological insulin resistance, where you're just running on a different fuel. Everything is shifted toward using that fuel and shifted away from using glucose. And if you shift over to a higher carb diet and you're healthy metabolically, your insulin sensitivity comes back. So it is a layer that's important, it has a lot of downstream effects, but I would say it's still a step beyond what's really going on, what really the underlying problem is. So that, that would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is the mainstream view of insulin resistance, right, when we're talking like in the textbook, they normally are pointing to free fatty acids interfering with insulin signaling. And so it's that's actually the kind of recognized, accepted uh, driver of, of the insulin resistance state. And my kind of next step of questioning is what's leading to the elevated free fatty acids. And that's where we have a couple of things. We have poor oxidation of glucose, which is then going to force fatty acid oxidation. We also have a shift hormonally where we see increases in the stress hormones, glucagon, adrenaline, and cortisol, which are the things that increase the release of free fatty acids from the adipose tissue and leads to high circulating levels of free fatty acids, which causes some issues, including furthering fatty acid oxidation and impairing insulin signaling. But those things are an effect that make the process worse. They contribute to the pathology. We don't want to have high amounts of those stress hormones. They also prevent effective thyroid hormone conversion, right? So we have less T4 to T3 conversion. They also will end up reducing testosterone production, uh, interfering with, with the number of you know different processes like digestion and immune function. So we don't want to be relying on, the, on that system at all. And it furthers the pathology, but I would say it's, it is... In a, so it's an important aspect. It's just, I would say, a layer above. Okay, so the release of free fatty acids is uh, caused by and enhanced by the release of stress chemicals, right? That's called lipolysis, is that correct? Mm -hmm. The breaking down of... So the question that I got, and this is the one I didn't have an answer for that I was 100% certain about, so I'm interested to hear your take on this. So people who have a lot of body fat, a lot of extra body fat, they would see that they are desiring to induce lipolysis because they're trying to get the fat out of their body. So they want to break down the fat. But of course, as they break down the fat, it's then going to uh, make this shift to fat being utilized as energy, which is less uh, ideal, as you say. We can maybe talk about why it's less ideal. Um, it's you know contributing to insulin resistance, as you just said. So 
So the question I had uh, that I got was, what's the solution to that then? If I'm trying to lose fat and yet lipolysis makes everything worse, it slows down, slows down my metabolism, it re reduces my energy. How do I do it? Is liposuction the only you know <laughs> answer? Actually, hoovering it out with some kind of device, or how do I get this fat out of my body? Yeah, luckily that's not <laughs> not the only solution. So when it comes to just looking at the adipose tissue, just looking at our fat stores, how do we reduce them? There's two sides of that equation. There's the fat being released from the fat stores and then the fat entering the fat stores or even carbohydrates entering the fat stores and being converted to fat. But that's disfavored compared to just converting fat straight to fat because that's much more efficient. So we need to consider both of those sides. And just because we're increasing the fat release side doesn't mean that we're increasing the net fat release because we often have more fat coming in as well. It's a circular system. And so what there's a couple of different things that we can think of that support this. Firstly is when we're overweight, we already have higher baseline levels of lipolysis. When we have extra adipose tissue, we're already increasing the fat release. You know, any we can have the same level of whatever stress hormone, glucagon, adrenaline, cortisol, the same level of the the hormones that drive lipolysis, and yet we'll have increased levels of, of lipolysis as a result because we have much more fat to release and we'll see higher levels of free fatty acids at baseline. In fact, higher levels of free fatty acids is associated with metabolic syndrome significantly and increases as it gets worse. So if it was as simple as just release more fat to lose the fat, then any then the worse de degenerate, degeneration you had, the worse insulin resistance you had, the more fat you would lose. And we definitely don't see that happening. So that's one line of evidence. Another one that I would suggest is a lot of people use that as a suggestion to use something like a low-carb diet where you have a lot more lipolysis. But... What ends up happening when we go to a low-carb diet is we just shift the fuel transport systems from glucose-based to fat-based. So we see a lot more lipids in the blood. We see a lot more free fatty acid release. We see a lot more LDL typically, which is basically transport, especially the VLDL, which is a transport of triglycerides. And then we see increased LDL as a result of that. And that's just a representation of a shift in fuel usage because at the same time, you have much more uh, triglyceride uptake and much more free fatty acid uptake at the adipose tissue and at the liver. So in the same way that you, when you're using more glucose, you're running through your glycogen stores faster and replenishing them faster. It's like, this is our main fuel. The same thing happens with fat. It doesn't actually mean that we're losing fat. And there are a number of studies, metabolic ward studies, where they see, they put people on a low carb diet and they have lower levels of insulin, much higher levels of lipolysis, much higher levels of fatty acid oxidation, but they don't lose more body fat. And that's just because there's more fats being taken back up by the fat stores too. So we want to not get caught up in this idea that fat burning and fat release is the pure solution. We have to consider the other side of the equation. And then it gets a lot more complicated where we're talking about things like stress hormones that increase the deposition of free fatty acids in or any, any uh, fuel in, into the fat stores and impair our ability to utilize the fuel that's that's coming into the bloodstream. And that's really where we want to focus. If we're not effectively converting the fuel that's coming in into energy, it has to be stored, right? That's, that is the other option. And then we end up storing it as body fat. If we fix that capacity for energy production, then we don't have to worry about it being stored as body fat because the fuel is actually being used and we have enough energy, which helps to then turn off our hunger. So we're not overeating, so to speak, or excessively hungry. And then we don't also have the storage of fat. And so just to real succinctly answer the question, come back to the beginning. Even if we're on a very high carb diet, we're still going to have some lipolysis. This is not a 100 and zero. It's not a black and white situation. At baseline, we have a decent amount of lipolysis and it's even higher if you have more body fat stores. It is more than enough. If you are still utilizing those fats more than substrate is being stored in the fat stores, you'll be okay. And when we're eating a higher carb diet, we're still burning fat as well. Again, we're not talking black and white. We're not talking 100 and zero. So we're always going to be using some fatty acids. Our heart really likes to use fatty acids. Our muscles like to use fatty acids at rest. That's going to happen even if we're on a pretty high carb diet. And that's good. They, those are, especially if we think about the muscles, muscles have very low energy demands. And because of that at rest, using fatty acids is perfect. There's no issue with that. And that can happen while we're still eating lots of carbs and not forcing tons of lipolysis and forcing areas that don't want to be running on fat to run on fat. Yeah, that makes sense. And the answer I gave is, you know, the focus of the bioenergetic approach, as far as I understand, is that we're trying to increase the metabolism, which, you know, part of that, as you say, is shifting more to a glucose burning rather than a fat burning 
state. And then when you do that, the metabolism is so high that even the release of free fatty acids is not uh, as detrimental. Would that... Uh, is that also an accurate element of it, would you say? Yeah. And again, baseline levels of lipolysis and baseline levels of free fatty acids are fine. We actually need that. We don't want it to go too low because that will actually induce stress as well. And I think that's something that's not often talked about in the bioenergetic space. We focus a lot on glucose dropping. If blood sugar drops, we have to release stress hormones. Not a good thing. If free fatty acids drop too low, if we're on a super, super low fat diet, and maybe especially if we're leaner, because if we have more body fat, we'll release more anyway at baseline. But if we're eating very little fat and our free fatty acids drop, that will also cause a stress response to release more free fatty acids because we need to have some fatty acids available. We use them for hormones. We use them for digestion. We use them for the uh, structure of all of our cells. So fats are important too. And the solution is not just to go you know, high carb, zero fat in the same way it's not to go high fat, zero carb. That's the way I would think about it. And we want to consider both of those sides. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Okay, and I think something that we have to address at this stage, although you might be sick of talking about it by now, is why is carbohydrate a superior fuel to fat? Because obviously there's a whole philosophy, which you're very familiar with because you were an adherent of it for years, that says that fat is a superior form of fuel. I remember I first heard that from Tony Robbins. You know, he was big into that for a while, um, burning fat as fuel. It's a much longer laster. It's a much cleaner burning source of fuel, all of that kind of stuff. So tell us why that's incorrect. Why is carbohydrate superior? Even though you need both, as you just said, so we clarified that, but why overall do you want to shift to having more of your energy coming from carbohydrate? So there are, some of this is tissue dependent, as we we're kind of saying, certain tissues are totally fine with something like fat, which does burn low and slow, not necessarily clean, actually kind of less clean, not that that's the greatest analogy, but We'll come back to that. But that's why it burns slower is because if it burns too fast, it causes a lot of exhaust, causes a lot of reactive oxygen species. But that's fine in tissues that need that kind of low slow. When we're talking about our brain, this is why they can't use fatty acids. They need a very clean source of, of fuel. They need to produce a lot of ATP in short periods of time. And other tissues, of course, prefer glucose. And there are some that can kind of use either, and we'd really prefer for them to use glucose. And so the reason for that I think firstly, it's helpful to back up a little bit and think about uh, biologically why we might want to rely more on fats or carbs and what they signal. And so the clearest situation we can look at is a situation of famine or starvation where we don't have any exogenous fuel coming in. And in that case, we rely on the fuel that we store really well, which is body fat. And when we're running on fat in that situation, we want to make sure that we are not running at a very high metabolic rate, because if we did do that, we would run out of fuel very quickly, and then we would not survive the famine or the starvation for very long. And so the burning of fat itself and the reliance on fat over glucose has a lot of signals built in that tell our bodies to turn their metabolic rate down adaptively. It's a really good thing that we have this in place. And carbohydrates essentially signal the opposite. They signal the abundance, they signal the availability of fuel, where we have enough to increase our metabolic rate and utilize that energy for cognitive function and reproduction and digestion and all of the things that we can't favor and don't want to favor if we're starving. So the, this is a very, of course, a very intelligent system. And we see this happen in the, all of these signals start just in how we burn the different fuels. The difference between their oxidation starts off these signals that say, we have glucose, let's run a high metabolic rate, or we don't, we have fat. Let's decrease our metabolic rate. And so the, when we look at the comparison between the two on the glucose side, we start with glycolysis. 
On the fat side, we start with beta oxidation. They both go then through the Krebs cycle and then through the electron transport chain. As a result of the difference between glycolysis and beta oxidation, when we oxidize fats, they produce much higher amounts of FADH2, which is an electron carrier, relative to NADH, which is our other major electron carrier. And the difference is pretty significant. It's a 250% difference in terms of the ratio. So when we look at carboxidation, the NADH to FADH2 ratio is 250% higher than in fat oxidation. So this is a major metabolic switch that's going on. The difference in those electron carriers plays out at the electron transport chain, where the FADH2 drops off its electrons at complex 2, and the NADH drops them off at complex 1. There's some competition that occurs between those two complexes because they both uh, use the same electron acceptor, which is ubiquinone, and there's basically a limitation there in how much ubiquinone is available. And when we start relying more on the complex 2, we end up with a backup, and we aren't able to drop off the electrons as effectively at complex 1 with NADH, and so we end up with a buildup of NADH. This lowers the NAD to NADH ratio, which is the main barometer and signal that speeds up or slows down our respiration. And when that ratio is low, it slows down three different steps at the Krebs cycle, and then several different steps at glycolysis, and also the main step between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, which is pyruvate dehydrogenase. So there are a couple of other things that happen. You end up with a buildup of citrate, which then goes and inhibits phosphofructokinase, and a buildup of acetyl-CoA, which further inhibits pyruvate dehydrogenase. But the and that biochemistry is interesting, and I'm happy to kind of keep digging through it. But the essential point is when we are burning the fats because of this effect at the electron transport chain, it slows down the other metabolic processes, stops utilizing glucose, and stops the uptake of glucose. And that is very adaptive. It's a good thing, right? It's basically a way to say this is our low, slow burning fuel. And that's perfect. When we don't have fuel coming in, that's what we want to be relying on. But that signal doesn't just affect what's going on in the mitochondria. When we have less energy and also more reactive oxygen species that, that get produced as a result of this competition at the electron transport chain, that is really important because we need to then tell the rest of our body that we don't have a really good efficient fuel. We need to turn everything down low and slow. And that then turns into shifts in, in the hormonal state where we shift away from insulin and toward glucagon, adrenaline, and cortisol. Those then affect thyroid hormone production and conversion, which is our main metabolic regulator. It also directly affects the steroid hormone production, which is also a main metabolic regulator and, of course, regulator of, of reproduction. And, you know, that's, that's kind of like this, this cascade of effects that happens. And as I mentioned earlier, this is really clear when we look at the brain. This is the exact reason why the brain can't use fatty acids, because they produce a lot more reactive oxygen species relative to ATP. They're much less efficient. We can use ketones in our brain. Ketones work similarly to glucose, and that's totally fine. But if we're ever in a state where we're producing ketones, the vast majority of our body is running on fat, and that is the concern, not so much the, the ketones. And also, to get to that place, we have to have a lot of stress to drive ketone production. So do, is that clear? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, I think it's a very good explanation, uh, one of the best I've heard. I, I'm thinking about our listener, and I'm thinking, okay, so they're going to be thinking... The only objection I could really, I mean, other than the rare intellectual who argue, or, <laughs> you know, all the points about biology and stuff, but I think the, the, the more common objection that I might get to that is just, but I feel better on a ketogenic diet, or I feel better on a high fat diet. And I realize there are various reasons why that may be the case. Some of them you've already covered, but I, my question is, do you think that uh, some people actually feel better with a slower metabolism? for some reason like i my theory on this is uh i'll just say it and then I'll, I'll be interested to hear your take is that when the metabolism speeds up one of the things that happens is that uh, all the enzymes speed up including enzymes like aldehydes uh dehydrogenase and stuff and basically uh, and nrf2 and basically a lot of toxicity starts getting out of storage and starts being processed and i think that is potentially a reason why people feel uh, better with a slow metabolism another reason could be as the metabolism increases, the immune system starts working better, and then uh, chronic infections, which have been in a you know semi-dormant state for a long time, your immune system starts dealing with them, and then maybe the person feels worse, inflammation. So those are two theories I have as to why people maybe feel better on uh, with a slow metabolism. 
Uh, do you agree with that? Do you have your own theories? What, why, uh, or do you even agree with it at all? Do you think that people don't feel better with a slow metabolism? And I'm just misunderstanding it. I'm interested in your take on it. So I don't think a slow metabolism is the main reason why people feel better on low carb diets, but I do think it is a possible reason. And another, you know, so you mentioned a couple of possibilities there, which I think are both potentially valid. Another one is nutrient availability, right? If we're increasing our metabolic rate, but we're not getting, and especially using glucose, but we don't have enough vitamin B1 or we're prone to deficiency or something, we're not going to be able to support that high metabolic rate. So that could be another or another reason as well. That's a great point. And I think uh, everyone loves eating, but a lot of people don't love eating regularly, right? Like they just want to spend all day working, for instance, and like stopping for lunch is like a hassle. So yeah, that's, I think maybe that's another practical reason. Yeah. Eating enough, right? Our metabolic rate increases. We actually have to supply it not only with the micronutrients, but macronutrients and actual fuel. And yeah, that does require the inconvenience of fueling your body. And it's a pretty funny one because people have such a strong objection to that yet they have no objection to spending a lot of time working out, cold plunging, sauna, uh, sleeping, right? No one is saying, let's just get four hours of sleep because it's more convenient. We're, you know, we recognize- Some people is... are into that, but yeah, sure. I think there's less and less these days, yeah. Yeah, I think most, <laughs> <laughs> most people trying to optimize their health are trying to get enough sleep because they recognize how important that is for their health. And that's an important sacrifice, so to speak, is putting the time into sleeping as opposed to doing something quote unquote productive. We just don't think of eating the same way, but that's just a perspective. It's not actually, I think, based on any sort of reality. And when we shift the perspective to the realization that every time I'm eating, I'm actually further supporting my health and further supporting my metabolism, I think then it becomes a much easier intervention. But yeah, it, it's less convenient than fasting all day, for sure. Uh, and maybe if someone is a super high-powered, you know, productivity-based or focused, you know, entrepreneur or CEO or something, maybe... It's just not in the cards for them. But I, I think when it comes to health, that's the real question. Uh, eating more frequently is is an important aspect, or at least not fasting. And I think, that, sorry, another aspect of it that you addressed earlier as well is that fat metabolism requires and correlates with high levels of stress chemicals, correct? Mm -hmm. Like the whole, one of the whole points of biogenetics, from my understanding, is that higher levels of uh, energy coming from glucose and high levels of metabolism will reduce the stress chemicals. That's one of the whole goals of the process, right? But some people like stress chemicals. They like to be <laughs> in a highly adrenalized state. Um, and so then the uh, high carbohydrate, high metabolism would go counter to that, right? Yeah. And so that brings us to one of the next reasons why someone might, be, might feel a lot better on a low-carb diet, which is I mean, there's a couple of them, but one is running on stress hormones, right? So whether we're fasting and relying on coffee on an empty stomach or we're just avoiding the carbohydrates, we get much more glucagon, adrenaline, and cortisol. And this is also where some people have an objection. They say, well, if you measure the metabolic rate, it doesn't decrease. And that's true, at least initially it doesn't, but that's because the proportion of it that was driven by stress has increased. So instead of having very little of our metabolism, our, our expenditure driven by stress, we now have a much larger amount over time, that's going to come at a major cost. But yes, in the short term, you might even see a bump up in energy expenditure because you have all these stress hormones. And that can feel good. It especially feels good if our underlying metabolism, our metabolism without stress hormones is not functioning very well, then yeah, the stress hormones feel great. It's really the only way we're going to get energy. And it's going to help us get through the day and focus and all those other things. Over time, or sometimes even initially, it'll also lead to anxiety and trouble sleeping and trouble relaxing, maybe irritability as well. And longer term, it'll also then begin to inhibit reproductive capacity and and immune function and, and things like that. So it does come at a major cost, but it can be another reason why people feel a lot better when they shift to a low-carb diet. And there's two other really, really important ones that come to mind that actually can increase the metabolism in a healthy way. And this, and this comes to a couple of, I think, legitimate benefits that we get from a low-carb diet. I just think we can accomplish them in better ways that don't come at the cost of stress, like we've discussed. The first of these is taking out a lot of harmful things in the diet, like polyunsaturated fats, which are really good at interfering with our metabolism. And we often take out a lot of anti-nutrients in you know, raw vegetables and grains and things like that, and that can be really helpful and lead to us feeling better. Along with that, something that's tied right in is what's going on intestinally in our gut. Overgrowths of harmful bacteria are extraordinarily common, and the main thing that's going to feed them in general is fibers and carbohydrates. And so by cutting all of those out, 
and not feeding the bacteria, we dramatically lower endotoxin production, which is a lipopolysaccharide or LPS, which is an intense mitochondrial toxin it, to the point where in extreme cases, it'll cause death and sepsis. That's basically the driver of sepsis. And so reducing that by fasting or going on a low carb diet is ex extremely beneficial. One of the most beneficial things we can do. And so I think that's the biggest reason why people have benefits on low carb diets in terms of autoimmune conditions, joint pain, and and some, sometimes energy, although again, there's a lot of overlap with stress, but you know, weight loss, like people have a lot of those experiences and I don't want to discount them. They're very real, but I think we can accomplish them that same effect and reducing the endotoxin load without needing to go on a low carb diet, without needing to incur that stress. So that would be my preference there. So that's perfect. That leads perfectly into the next topic I wanted to talk about. So that's awesome. Um, one of the things I found very interesting about uh, Ray Pete's approach, and I wonder if yours is the same or if it's different, uh, was, you know, because in the last 10 years, there's such an emphasis on the microbiome and you want to have as much diversity as possible and all that kind of stuff. And his approach seemed to be more, no, no you just want as little as possible of all these organisms in your intestines. Uh, you know, you can correct me if, you, if, I, if I've misinterpreted that, but that's the... Uh, impression that I got. So, uh, and obviously I know he, he would still talk about, you know, the, the, you want the right ones more than the wrong ones and stuff like that. But I, I like the idea that he said, basically, <laughs> just as little as possible of all of them makes sense, because even the so-called commensal ones, like the okay ones are still creating endotoxin, right? A lot of them. Um, so, so yeah, first of all, do you agree with that? And then second of all, I'd like to go into probably what you're about to talk about anyway, which is what would your approach be to reducing endotoxin, to reducing these organisms in the gut? Yeah, sure. So Ray was very clear that in terms of our small intestine, we want that clear of, of microbes, clear of bacteria. And I think most people would agree on that. And he placed a pretty big emphasis on it. And he would also point out that in studies with rats and mice, where they had fully clear colons, like large intestines, they were pretty resistant to disease that other rats were not resistant to, right? They would, it was, you know, whether we're talking autoimmune conditions or insulin resistance or fatty liver, or whatever it is, if you don't have any bacteria, it's really hard to create those things. And I think what that points to is how much of an impact a poor microbiome can have, right? If we are disrupting it, if we're excessively feeding it, if we're creating a lot of endotoxin, that is a prerequisite for pretty much every disease process. And we do see that, by the way, in humans, you see what they call metabolic endotoxemia, more mild levels where you're not in the hospital. You see that in cardiovascular disease, in plaque. You see that in diabetes and insulin resistance. You see it in obesity. So I think that is more of my takeaway there is the using that as an example of how much of an impact these things can have. And then the next step, which is, how much of a benefit we can have by reducing endotoxin. And so I, I don't think we want to have a fully sterile colon. And I don't, I don't really think Ray did either. Um, but I think he would just point to that as a way to free ourselves of disease as an example of, of how much of an impact these things can have. And I do think if we were to fully clear out our large intestine, it would leave us very prone to infection. And that's of course something we, we don't want, you know, there is a, one of the main benefits of having commensal bacteria is that it helps to outcompete harmful bacteria and fungi and things like that that we're going to be exposed to. So I do think that there's that it is important to have them. And the as you said, then the next question is how do we make sure that that's the state that we're creating a sterile small intestine and a large intestine without overgrowth of bacteria, without harmful ones, but instead just the beneficial ones. So do you have an answer, <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. is it too difficult to uh, at least a summary? Let's say. Yeah, so I think there's a number of, of kind of baseline things. And then, of course, there are the times where those baseline things are not enough and we need to get into to deeper strategies. The first is if we have, well, so I, I guess even backing up from there, regardless of what's going on, we want to make sure that we are generally not feeding ourselves the wrong things. And what I would say fall in that category would be things like grains, legumes, and nuts and seeds that are not properly processed and have high amounts of anti-nutrients whether we're talking lectins, oxalates, phytates, uh, saponins, you know, all of those. And that's because those things will impair digestion. They impair digestion of protein and starch and also prevent the absorption of minerals and then will also contribute to the growth of harmful bacteria, just independently creating an inflammatory state in the gut and, and encouraging the growth of harmful endotoxin-producing bacteria. 
So I would say those are things that we generally want to minimize in our diet unless we are preparing them properly, in which case I think some can be okay in terms of the grains and legumes, you know, if we're soaking and sprouting them or fermenting them. At that point where it's a tolerance issue of how much, how sensitive we are to those things. But uh, I would I would say at least we want that. When it comes to the nuts and seeds, because of the polyunsaturated fats in there, the omega-6s and 3s, I would say even if they're traditionally prepared, even if they're soaked and sprouted, I would still generally avoid them uh, for that for that reason. So, Except for macadamia, right? That's the only one yeah. about omega-6s. Yeah, macadamias and uh, coconut. You know, cocoa. Oh, coconut, yeah. Yeah. True. Uh, yeah. And so, and then the other category there would be things like raw leafy greens, which are very high in anti nutrients. Cooking them helps to reduce them. Depending on the type, it only reduces them so much. So, again, depending on our sensitivity, we might want more or less of those. But, uh, and other raw vegetables too. Again, we want to be pretty careful there and aware of the anti nutrient content. And so that would be the first thing is possibly reducing or removing those entirely can make a huge difference microbiome-wise and gut health-wise. And then if we are in a situation where we're, well, I guess then the next point, even before thinking about the microbiome, is are we breaking down our food well, right? If we have low stomach acid, if we have poor bile flow, if we have slow motility for not producing enough digestive enzymes, we can be eating the best foods without any anti-nutrients, but we're not efficiently breaking down and absorbing them all, and so there's excess being pass through that's then feeding bacteria and contributing contributing to overgrowths on its own or on their own. So I think those we then want to make sure we're addressing our digestive capacity well. You know, again, stomach acid, bile, motility, and digestive enzymes. And then once that's in place, then I'd be thinking about the microbiome itself. And if we are already at that point and we have excess of overgrowths of bacteria or can't eat or you know fungi, we want to minimize the feeding of those while we work on clearing them out and then bring back the kind of healthy fibers or healthy fermentable carbohydrates to allow for some of the beneficial bacteria to grow. And on that front, I'd be thinking about fruits, juices, and you know, cooked root vegetables, maybe some cooked vegetables. And the reason for that is because these are things that are going to be very low in anti-nutrients. They're going to have some fibers and fermentable carbohydrates, but the ones that typically preferentially feed the more beneficial bacteria and they'll also have polyphenols. And polyphenols are generally very poorly absorbed and have pretty effective antimicrobial effects. And this is why oftentimes they're used as, you know, antimicrobials, you know, in a supplement. You might use oregano oil or thyme or something like that, or polyphenols from fruits, you know, like lemon or something like that. And that's because they have pretty effective antimicrobial effects. And so when we have those alongside some of those fermentable carbohydrates, it helps to keep the harmful bacteria at bay helps to preferentially feed the beneficial ones. And when we have good digestion, good motility, and a good metabolic rate, which is kind of all intertwined, then that will generally lead to a pretty healthy state gut-wise. That makes sense. And so interesting, I noticed you mentioned root vegetables there, which of course is primarily starch. And that was one of the things about Ray Pete's approach which surprised me, like his claim that the fundamental thing, and again, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but what I saw is that the fundamental thing that feeds these gut bacteria and, and creates endotoxin is starch. When, I mean, my understanding is that it's more either carbohydrates in general or more specifically, you know, FODMAPs, right, which includes fructose. So the preference for fructose over starch in terms of not feeding bacteria is interesting to me. It's not something I'd heard before. And it also doesn't correspond to my experience. I have had long-standing pathogenic intestinal bacterial issues. I think it's really the main things that cause my health issues, along with having high levels of lead in my blood and low levels of thyroid. Those are like, that's the tram for it, which really uh, knocked me down for a long time. But anyway, uh, if from a practical point of view, uh, root vegetables are great, and then fruits, not so much. Uh, so yeah, I'm interested to, you know, you, you said both, you're, you're happy using both. So in what circumstances do you feel like one is better than the other? Like, uh, what is your preference? So I think the recommendation is going to be different when we're, when we have a healthy microbiome versus overgrowth. So when we have a healthy microbiome, we shouldn't be concerned at all about FODMAPs or fermentable carbohydrates because uh, generally, it's not going to cause an issue if it's coming with polyphenols, good digestion, and then feeding the quote-unquote good bacteria. That's the way I would think of it. But when it comes to... So 
When it comes to starch, I know Ray would talk about some concerns about it actually digesting very, very quickly and causing an excessive spike in blood sugar and then potentially causing a crash and that being a concerning aspect. Oh, really? I thought, it, I thought his issue is that it fed bacteria and led to endotoxin. That's more what I'd come across. Maybe I've uh, misunderstood that. I think the starch thing makes more sense, right? Like a potato is extremely high glycemic index, for instance, when it's cooked. So yeah, I, I, that seems totally valid to me. Yeah, I know for sure I've seen that. It's been a while since I've listened to a lot of his interviews. So he might have also mentioned at some point that some starches or maybe some starch containing foods are very likely to feed endotoxin when we're talking about grains, for example. But I thought my recollection, which again could be skewed, is uh, that he really favored or his real concern with the starches was the effect on blood sugar and just having the pure glucose without the fructose and a very oh, quick okay. digesting effect. Uh, Fair enough. But, okay, so it's not necessarily that it feeds bacteria more. And as you say, I mean, no fermentable carbohydrate is a problem if you have an optimal environment in there, right? Yeah, and I do think, so FODMAPs, I think in general are a good idea, but I think there's some, I don't think it's it's perfect in its application. So as an example, you mentioned fructose being a concern as a FODMAP, and it's true, fructose in amounts on its own or in excess in the range of five to 15 grams tends to be an issue. But there's very, very few fruits that actually have excess fructose like that, especially when you consider the sucrose content. So one of the things I see all the time is people pointing to these fruits with excess fructose, but they don't consider the sucrose content, which is 50-50. And so you might have, let's say, a three to one ratio, like three grams of fructose to one gram of glucose. And you say, oh, well, if I have a normal serving there, I'm going to have excess fructose. But then when you consider that's also with 10 grams of sucrose, then we're looking at eight to six, which is actually not too far off as far as a ratio. So... There are some aspects like that that I think are kind of missed. And the other part is starch. So while starch hypothetically shouldn't be a uh, FODMAP, neither should lactose, neither should a lot of, well, I think those are really only two and then potentially fructose because we should be able to digest and absorb them. But people can have issues breaking down lactose and they can also have issues breaking down starch, right? There are starch digesting inhibitors in grains. If we have overgrowth, we can often have and low thyroid, we can have reductions in different digestive enzymes, including amylase. So starch could become a fermentable carbohydrate in some people. And I think that we want to consider that too. So there are situations where it could feed bacteria, even though in a healthy person, it shouldn't. So it's, I think there's a lot of nuance there, but the general idea that you're getting at is that, yes, we want to minimize the feeding of bacteria with fermentable carbohydrates when we have overgrowths, while we work on improving our digestion, clearing them out, and then very slowly reintroducing them. And I just think we want to be a little bit more careful than the standard FODMAP approach and consider things with a bit more nuance when it comes to what might actually ferment. And in terms of clearing them out is uh, obviously not feeding them at all. The challenge with that is then you're not giving the cells the carbohydrate they need, right? Whether it's a, you know, a low FODMAP diet with also, what's it called, specific carbohydrate diet that's basically almost no carbohydrate. Uh, so that's one of the approaches for SIBO. Uh, or the anti-candida diet that's usually pretty much very low carbohydrate as well. So you're potentially maybe resolving one issue or addressing one issue, but you're creating a different issue, right? By going for a long time with so few carbohydrates. So so what, what would be your approach to that if a client had uh, that issue? Yeah, I mean, you can have a high carb diet that's low fermentable, and that's normally my recommendation. So there are a number of fruits that are very low in FODMAPs. I would say the majority are low. You know, there's some that we want to be careful with, you know, the high FODMAP ones, things like apples, pears, watermelon, the stone fruits, you know, nectarines, plums, uh, cherries, maybe mangoes, depending on our sensitivity. Other than that, there's a ton of very low fermentable carb uh, carbohydrates in fruits like, you know, oranges, mandarins are very considered very low FODMAP. Most berries are very, very low. Uh, pineapple, melons other than watermelon. You know, there's a lot of options there that are still really good options when it comes to uh, low fermentable carbohydrates. And then we also have juice. So outside of apple juice and, you know, pear juice, which are very high in fermentable carbohydrates, despite being a juice, most juices, you know, orange, pineapple, grape, pomegranate, berry juices are all very low in terms of their fermentation effect. And typically honey and maple syrup are also pretty low. Again, May, depending on the amount that we're having in a sitting of something like honey, we might want to keep an eye on the fructose, uh, but it can really vary as well. It's hard to say that because the amount, the fructose to glucose ratio in honey can vary a lot depending on the, the variety of honey. But in I any believe case, the more, crystal, more crystallizes, the higher it is glucose to fructose. Mm, okay. 
I, I didn't know that, but that would make sense as to why I think a lot of people prefer the more light colored crystallized ones. The sweeter, yeah, more fructose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, it, yeah, in any case, I would recommend that we do basically a low fermentable, still high carbohydrate diet so that we're not tanking our metabolism, lowering our immune function, lowering our thyroid, which contributes to what allows for something like SIBO in the first place, right? And that's the, the thing that I think so few people are identifying who are focused on gut health is you can clear things out all you want, but if you don't fix the environment, it's just going to come back. And I see that so many times with something like SIBO. And that's because, you know, hypothyroidism, the connection with hypothyroidism and SIBO is very, very strong. Same thing with stomach acid, bile flow, and SIBO, and those all four of those together, and motility, all five of those things are directly linked. Low metabolism leads to low motility, low bile flow, low stomach acid, it, you know, uh, leads us to a state where we're very much vulnerable to something like SIBO. And then if we just worry about cleaning out the SIBO, but we're on a low carb diet and not fixing those other things, then we're going to end up with it coming right back because we're not fixing what actually led to it in the first place. So if we try to just starve it out and clear it out without fixing the state and while going on a low carb diet, I think it's largely ineffective in most cases. And so that's why my preference would be don't feed it, but still feed ourselves a lot of carbs. And that's not such a difficult thing considering that, you know, the carbohydrates should be broken down and absorbed very quickly. And then we can work on clearing it out at the same time and, and improving our digestive capacity. There are some exceptions where the SIBO or CIFO is so bad that and so high up in the small intestine that maybe we're still feeding it a bit when when we're consuming some of those carbohydrates. Maybe we need slightly lower doses so that there's less of, you know, so we're absorbing it a little better. But at that point, I think we just need to work on clearing it out at the same time as 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 we work on supporting our general state, physiological state. And then that would be with either herbs or antibiotics or some kind of combination? Yeah, yeah. I think different situations warrant different approaches. If it's, you know, bad enough and we've tried a number of things, then I don't have any issue using something like rifaximin or, you know, maybe in combination with neomycin when we're talking about SIBO or using certain antifungal, you know, pharmaceutical antifungals when we're talking about fungal overgrowth. But generally, I prefer to start with the gentler, quote, more natural things, not just because natural is better, but because they tend to be a bit more selective and tend not to clear out those harmful bacteria as much. Again, when we're talking about something like rifaximin, that's not a concern at all anyway. So I think that's that's pretty safe as far as pharmaceutical ones go. So Yeah, I actually think rifaximin is probably safer than some things like garlic or oregano in terms of it being a bit more selective. Yeah. Very interesting. All right. Well, awesome. That actually leads us nicely to my next question, which is about thyroid. Um, I didn't find a video of yours yet that addresses thyroid and whether you, you know, Ray was a big fan of supplementation with people if they need it. And obviously his criteria about whether they need it was largely based on temperature, kind of similar to uh, Broder Barnes. Obviously, it's not his only approach. Uh, I know that obviously eating a high carbohydrate diet, for instance, would be another way to raise metabolism. And there's you know plenty of other strategies. But what's your take on thyroid? First of all, would you agree that uh, it's uh, that what's the word suboptimal thyroid function is way more common than people think? And second of all, what is your preferred strategy for addressing that? Yeah, so we did a a five part series talking about hypothyroidism and thyroid. So episodes 95 through 99, which must have just ah, escaped okay, your search. I didn't see but, that yet. Right. I'll check that out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I very much agree with the premise, uh, principles and, and really application when it comes to Ray's view on, on thyroid. Hypothyroidism is incredibly common, incredibly highly diagnosed, and still incredibly underdiagnosed, meaning that a lot of people are known to have it and way more have it that we don't even recognize because of basically lab ranges being way skewed and not looking in the right places, not looking at body temperature and metabolic rate and things like that. So I think, you know, the, it's really crazy, the history there, right? The ranges of TSH were based on a faulty iodine uptake test that was not actually correlated or related to thyroid function very well, but they used that original test to identify the portion of the population that has hypothyroidism and then extrapolated that to TSH ranges. But anyway, they're starting to improve those a little bit. Uh, you know, going from saying up to 10 is okay to now, you know, four or four and a half, but still way off. Anyway, uh, I, th I think when we're talking about thyroid, we're talking about the master metabolic regulator, right? When our thyroid production and conversion is high, our metabolism ha is high and vice versa. And so with that in mind, considering that our metabolic function is the main thing determining our health, if we're dealing with health issues, we're typically dealing with a low 
or inefficient metabolic state. And that typically involves low thyroid activity. In pretty much every case, I don't like to start by adding thyroid hormones to that mix because there's a reason why we're not producing or converting the thyroid hormones well. And that's because we're not providing an environment where our bodies are ready to do that, right? We're providing a scarcity environment environment where there's not a lot of energy available. And so we don't want to just add on this. We don't want to just press on the gas pedal when the engine isn't working effectively or efficiently. So my feeling is always that we want to start with the fundamentals, things like digestion, as we discussed, things like bringing in carbohydrates, getting our lifestyle in a good spot with stress and sleep. And then we can use something like thyroid if needed to kind of shortcut or further speed up the process or if we're getting stuck at points. And the relate, I mean, the correlation between hypothyroidism and pretty much every disease, pretty much every organ system is, is pretty clear and pretty pronounced. And so the number of things that this can help with is, yeah, it, it can't be understated. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, as is the underpinning of uh, uh, your kind of philosophy, en energy and mitochondrial cell energy is the the basic currency of every cell and every system in the body. So uh, it, it amazes me when I see like guides to um, how to improve your metabolism and how to increase ATP function. There's all these things like CoQ10 and carnitine and all the rest of it, and they don't mention thyroid. And like, haven't you forgotten like the most important <laughs> element of all? Uh, <laughs> so it's really great that, you know, that you address that thoroughly, as you say. Uh, is there any other strategies for increasing metabolism that you personally like, like uh, red light therapy, aspirin? I know a lot of people in uh, the biogenetic community are into uh, progesterone, pregnenolone. Is there anything else like that, that that you're a fan of? Yeah. So I normally would consider those things to be kind of extras or things that are more advanced that we want to tackle later on. And the reason for that, and kind of we mentioned this earlier, talking about what most people take away from the Ray Peak community, not necessarily Ray himself, but they'll take away a some sort of rigid dietary approach and then lots of different supplements, hormones, things like aspirin, things like thyroid, and just throw it all together. And each of those things can be super helpful when used properly, when we're in a good place, but they can actually be really detrimental when that's not the case, right? If we take someone who is coming from a pretty rough spot and we just throw on a bunch of I mean, even something like red light or a bunch of methylene blue or niacinamide or thyroid, we can create a lot of issues. We can exacerbate stress considerably. So there is a place for each of those things. And I am a fan of each of those things. I just think generally we want to be careful uh, and make sure we're using them properly. But as far as things that fit in that toolbox or, or in that toolbox, I do think red light is a great one. I think aspirin can be a really helpful one as well. B vitamins, B1, B3, and then a number of the others. You know, B2, B5, B6. I mean, so many potential benefits from B vitamins, uh, thyroid hormones, as we discussed, other pro-metabolic hormones like pregnenolone, progesterone, DHEA. As I mentioned, methylene blue can be another really helpful supplement here. Uh, breath work, you know, like proper breathing, buteco breathing, which I know you've discussed as well, I think is another really helpful tool for increasing CO2, which is, you know, one of the more fundamental things involved with making sure we're producing energy effectively, keeping stress hormones down. So yeah, I think there's a lot of really helpful tools that... I'm surprised how few people in the Rapid community embrace Buteco considering the overlap between their goals and their understanding of how things work. So I'm happy to hear that, you know. But again, I guess it's something that if, if you do it, especially the intense version, uh, too early on, you're going to make things worse, as you just said. And I think that is part of your philosophy, right? Like there's various things like fasting... Uh, cold exposure, Wim Hof breathing, which is really specifically geared to uh, significantly increasing the stress hormones temporarily, right? Like adrenaline and cortisol. So the idea behind that is that they're hormetic, meaning that it's like a temporary stress, but that ultimately, you know, strengthens you. And, you know, they certainly, all of these methods have significant research and evidence that they are beneficial. I am quite, uh, what's the word, reluctant to recommend them to people unless I think that they're at a place where it's actually a good idea. Uh, and I, I've seen in your content that you feel the same way. Could you explain a little bit more why you don't necessarily recommend those things to people? Yeah, absolutely. And just to come back real quickly to Buteco breathing, Ray was a big fan of anything that would increase carbon dioxide. And so I, I found Buteco breathing through him 
he also would talk about altitude as basically a way of the same idea, right? Lowering oxygen uh, availability in the air that we're breathing in and other methods as well. And of course, one of the main differences that we didn't talk about between carbon fat utilization or oxidation is the production of CO2. And when we use carbohydrates, we produce 50% more carbon dioxide than fat. So when it comes to oxygenating the cells, that's another aspect of the signaling system where when we're using fat as a part of the slowing down of respiration, a part of that mechanism involves less op oxygen uptake. So uh, whereas carbs is, is the opposite. So yeah, I, I think it's a pretty fundamental one and yeah, one that can be really, really helpful. I think it's a very helpful tool. I imagine though you're not doing like you're not recommending people do the maximum pauses where you build up to you know holding your breath for three four minutes or something like that because of the impacts it will have on your stress chemicals or am I wrong about that? So I take a more uh, a, a, a more surface level approach when it comes to buteco. I think some of the some of the techniques or exercises can be really helpful, but my general recommendation is breathe through your nose slow down your breathing, intentionally work on slowing it down, consider mouth taping at night, those kinds of things, as opposed to it being kind of like a, a primary tool where I think we really need to do exactly what you said, you know, getting the three to four minute control pause or something. Yeah, that makes sense. And what about the other stuff like the cold exposure? Uh, what, what's your opinion on that one? Yeah. So as you said, those are coming from this perspective of hormesis, which is the idea that a little bit of something damaging, stressful, or toxic causes a defensive reaction in our bodies that makes us stronger and better able to adapt to further damage and stress, and that that's a good thing. And not only is that a good thing, but that is the way to health. And I, we can talk about the specifics here, right? I mean, low carb is something that fits into something that's hormetic, and I think it can have benefits. I don't think any of those benefits are because of hormesis, right? We talked about things like the gut and a number of others. I. I have a pretty, I would say everything about the bioenergetic perspective is basically anti-hormesis on a fundamental pers like principle level, uh, you know, not necessarily on a practical level. And the reason why I make that distinction is because this doesn't mean we don't want to ever do anything that causes stress. Stress is going to happen with beneficial things like exercise and I don't know, like any, anything that happens in our life, there's going to be some level of stress. But that doesn't mean that the stress is what accounts for the benefits. And that's the idea behind hormesis. And I would say it's actually a very, very dangerous idea. And we see that when we look through the history and look at its origins. It starts with basically the chemical industry trying to defend its pollution and the exposure that we get to heavy metals and other pollutants in food and in our environment and our water. And what they basically said was, yes, these things are really toxic in high doses, but in low doses, they're actually just causing a little bit of, of damage and that causes a defensive reaction that's beneficial. So it's okay to have small amounts of these in your water and in your food and, and don't worry about us polluting the environment. That's, that's the origin story of, of hormesis. And then since then, it's been extrapolated into this idea where, you know, as we were talking about certain interventions that are stressful, like fasting and cold thermogenesis, are beneficial because of the stress that they cause, not because of some other reason, but because of the stress. And it's actually morphed into something even worse, which is now, and we won't go too far down that rabbit hole because it's not what the average person is thinking of, but I think it's important to identify that this is becoming more and more dangerous over time scientifically, which is that the, the kind of evolution of this idea now is that Anything that is beneficial is only beneficial because of the stress that it causes. Basically, the only way that something can provide benefit is through hormesis. And you see these papers, these published scientific papers, saying that the reason why water is beneficial, the reason why vitamins and minerals are beneficial, and a number of other things is because of the stress that they cause. Basically, too much of them is harmful, too little is also harmful, but you get this right zone where you're just causing enough stress, and that's how they provide benefits. And without going too far down that path, I think not only is it anti-scientific, but I think it's also a dangerous thought process that can lead to us doing some pretty ridiculous things in the name of health or lead to, you know, exposure to pollutants and things like that in the name of health as well. So that's kind of the extremes of it. But when we zone in on what most people are talking about in terms of hormesis, I still think that there are issues here. And so a lot of this comes back to, or someone that made this very clear is Hans Selye, who is basically the person who coined stress and our stress response. And what he identified was that every stressor that we could be exposed to, a stressor is something that uses energy and can cause stress. 
whether we're talking about walking or a pollutant or you know heavy metal or endotoxin or a fight with a significant other, anything that can potentially cause stress has basically two different categories of effects. One of these is called the stressor effect, which is a universal effect that is the same between all these things, whether we're talking sunlight or mercury, they each have a stressor effect, which is the ability or the how the extent to which it requires the usage of energy, right? Both of those things will use some energy just like, you know, exercise would. Then there's the other side, which are called the specific effects. And these are the effects that are unique to each stimulus, right? The things that make sunlight different from mercury, which are important. And what he basically identified was that the stressor effect not only is universal between the stressors, but our response to it is universal. So if we have enough of a stressor effect, it will put us into stress. And that has downstream negative consequences, regardless of what's causing it. That is inherently negative. But the specific effects can be either positive or negative. And in some cases, they can outweigh that stress. And in some cases, they can actually make it worse. So in the case of something like a moderate amount of exercise, not something extreme, normally the specific effects, the effects on the musculature and cardiovascular system and lymphatic system and all of these other things are really beneficial and they outweigh the amount of stress that the exercise causes leading to a state where exercise is beneficial, but it is beneficial despite the stress that it caused, not because of the stress that it caused. And we can say the same thing about sunlight or something like low carb, right? Where we were, as we were discussing, we might feel a bit better by, because of the stress, but it's actually having a negative long-term effect, but we, it still might be beneficial in that the relief from endotoxin, let's say, could far outweigh the amount of stress that we're getting. And that's a case where we look at that, that situation and it's not beneficial because of the stress it caused. It's not beneficial because of the reactive oxygen species and all, you know, the activation of all these hormetic pathways, the sort of two ends and the, the uh, uh, NRF2 and AMPK and all of that. It's not beneficial because of those things. It's actually beneficial because it's opposing those by providing some really beneficial specific effects. And so that is the place that I would land, of course, to kind of... Uh, get into the details of why I think that's the case and the support for it is is a longer conversation, but I would say that's how I would interpret these things. And I think what that then means is we don't want to do something just because it spikes adrenaline and increases stress and we react to that in, in a defensive way. Rather, we'd want to do something because it actually benefits us despite stress. Yeah, it's a very interesting concept. Do you have a episode or series of episodes where you do go into more depth about that? Yeah, I have a couple of, of pretty long articles on my website on hormesis and then a four-part series on the, of podcast episodes as well. Excellent. All right. So we'll make sure to check that out to so go into more detail about that. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. A couple of other just uh, quicker subjects before we finish, if that's okay. Um, first of all, well, maybe quicker. First of all, uh, so I know that Ray Pete was one of the people who really pioneered the idea that omega-6s are not very beneficial or beneficial at all, the whole seed oil thing. And I think these days in the natural health world, whatever you want to call it, that's taken root pretty substantially. A lot of people understand that and agree with that. The bit that's still way more controversial and way less agreed with is the thing about omega freeze, right? Uh, especially, you know, long chain omega freeze, the fish oils, the EPA, DHA. Uh, these are still believed almost universally to be beneficial, whether it's in the mainstream or the alternative health world. Um, I attempted to explain 
uh, the bioenergetic view of that in a video, and I think I did an okay job, but I would love to hear you know <laughs> a more sophisticated uh, explanation coming from a better understanding, and also I guess addressing that key uh, objection, which is, but what about all these studies that say omega three is beneficial? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I would say in all of the ways that omega sixes are harmful, the omega threes are worse. And yeah, that's which is the thing that's so surprising, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to most oh, people. definitely, right? And and I do think it's coming, maybe very slowly. I do think that'll be maybe the next one. We'll see. We'll see. Obviously, there's a much at the moment pharmaceutically a big industry behind omega threes. We'll we'll see what happens. But in any case, so one of the biggest concerns with omega sixes is that they're very easily oxidized and damaged. And this happens, of course, if they're you know cooked. But it can also happen just if they're exposed to oxygen and sunlight. It can also happen internally, you know, when we're at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and we've got a lot of oxygen floating around and we're, you know, these are getting into the engines of our cells where oxidation is very likely if there's, you know, if there's anything that can be oxidized. You know, reactive oxygen species are kind of always floating around there. So we're in a highly potentially oxidizable environment. And with that in mind, things that are not stable are things that we want to be careful with. Well, if we compare omega-3s to omega-6s, depending on the type, but in general, you basically have an extra double bond when you're talking about omega-3s because you, at that third carbon chain, you get a double bond there, whereas the omega-6s, it's not until the sixth one. So with the omega-3s, you have an opportunity for one more double bond for each type of fatty acid, essentially, which means it is that much more susceptible to peroxidation, often twice as susceptible. So that would be the first thing. And we see this also, right, when you look at products on the shelf, most, and this is shown in studies, most of the uh, fish oil products are already oxidized when they're on the shelf. We also see this when we look at digestion. Just digestion of the omega-3s is enough to create peroxidation of, of those fatty acids. And then we see it internally as well, right? We see, we can see how much they contribute to uh, peroxidation and we see that effect from the omega-3s. And so what that means is even if you do happen to get one of the ones on the shelf that is fully stable, and even if you add the antioxidants with it or whatever other form of omega-3s you're looking for, it is still going to be more susceptible per to peroxidation than omega-6s. And we see this play out in studies in animals and humans looking at taking omega-3 supplements or eating omega-3s, and uh, we see the increased peroxidation. So that would be the first thing, and I think one that's kind of easy to get behind considering that that's one of the main things that's pointed to for the omega-6s. One of the harder ones is what are called the icosanoids. These are metabolites of the omega-6s and omega-3s that are produced enzymatically. And these have what are considered to be either anti or pro-inflammatory effects. And generally, we think that the omega-6s have a pro-inflammatory effect and the omega-3s have an anti-inflammatory effect in terms of their icosanoids. And I think there's an important piece of nuance there that is not considered, which is how the omega-3s are having their anti-inflammatory effect. The, the kind of short answer of what I would get at there is what we find is that the way through which the omega-3s suppress inflammation is by suppressing our immune function, suppressing the activity of our immune system. And their effect in terms of immunosuppression is pretty well recognized to the point that they've been used in different grafts and uh, different transplantation type studies to prevent rejection of the new tissue because they suppress the immune system to that extent. And so that's another one that requires kind of parsing through the evidence. But what I would say is they are not just beneficial in terms of an anti-inflammatory effect. They're actually doing it by suppressing our immune function, which is not something that we would want to support. Well, I mean, isn't isn't it like, you know, for instance, rapamycin is something that a lot of people use for, you know, longevity because they really believe that that is effective. And of course, the main mechanism that that works by is by suppressing immune function considerably, right? I imagine even more than... A lot of high dose omega threes. So, uh, yeah, what what's your uh, evidence for the idea that suppressing the immune system is f not a good thing, given all of that uh, school of thought? I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'd like to hear the uh, the counter argument. Yeah, well, no, I think that's a bad. <laughs> it's a pretty bad showing for rapamycin. I think it's a reason not to use it, right? And it's pretty sure. strong. And I don't use it personally, it. but I'd like to hear the uh, what's the word? The objection to its use. Well, I mean, look at the the very well documented side effects of something like rapamycin and its immunosuppression, right? Not it's not like we're just going to get more of a cold, like the susceptibility to severe infection and you know, other 
immune related issues, potentially cancer related and things like that is, is real. And so I think there are good ways to reduce inflammation and not good ways. One of the not good ways is just to suppress our immune function, right? I, I think we could say like the same thing with plaque and in, in terms of the arteries, right? There is an immune component there, right? The macrophages have to be there to consume the oxidized lipids and, and produce those foam cells. So we can stop plaque formation by turning off our immune system, but that comes at a major cost, right? And so I, I don't think that's a cost worth having. Yeah. Okay. So the rapamycin and omega-3 may extend lifespan. The studies are not making it up, but they're doing it by a mechanism that's dangerous and that could cause all kinds of other problems. Would that be a, a succinct way of putting it or is it more complicated? Yeah. Well, so with a lot of these substances that are used to extend lifespan, this kind of comes back to the hormesis side of things. There's huge flaws in the research. They start by using something like C. elegans, which is a nematode, to show that something extends lifespan by increasing sirtuins. Like these are the pathways that are all identified there. And then when you look into it, the main way that they extend lifespan in C. elegans is by creating a stress response that causes hibernation, which of course we don't do, and dramatically extends the lifespan. It's what's called the dower phase uh, of C. elegans. It's like a part of their kind of stage of development, but they halt their development and go into hibernation. And they talk about this in the studies that basically energy production turns off, everything turns down. And in the wild, they would not be able to survive. But because we're looking at this in a lab, we see this extension in lifespan. But it's not actually because of the activity of these pathways being good. It's because of a unique aspect of something like C. elegans. When you look at caloric restriction in those different, you know, whether we're looking at C. elegans, which causes the same thing, or something like the rat studies looking at caloric restriction, what they typically find is that the only benefit of caloric restriction has to do with the control groups that are fed ad libitum. So they'll have one group that's access, has access to unlimited amount of rat chow, which of course is like a pretty uh, terribly <laughs> composed diet. And then you have a group that's restricted. And the group that has ad libitum access gets all sorts of diseases, is overweight, and has a shortened lifespan. And the caloric restricted group outlives them. And they say, oh, caloric restriction is great. But it's really just overconsumption of these really harmful, <laughs> this like terrible rat chow, right? You know, pure. It's more toxin restriction diet. than calorie right, restriction. Right. Yeah, exactly. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And, they, and that brings you know, us, oh, sorry. I, I think that brings us to the fundamental aspect of bioenergetics, which I think is so interesting, which I'd love to hear your take on quickly, which is, of course, the increasing metabolism. This, if you see the body as a machine, which, of course, science has tended to do ever since Newton then machines tend to wear out and you want to kind of reduce their use to if you want them to extend their lifespan like with a car you you know you take it out as little as possible you drive it as slowly as possible to some degree right you don't drive very quickly because that's using it up more quickly and people treat the human body as this as if it's the same thing so they actually want to uh, you know some people who are trying to extend lifespan they want to reduce metabolism because they believe that then you know, there's this idea as well that you only have a certain amount of heartbeats. And so if you, you know, uh, do a lot of aerobic exercise and you get your heart rate right down, then you're going to live longer because you're using up less of the heartbeats or you're using them more slowly. The bioenergetic view, as I understand it, is that we are not a physical, you know, we're not a machine. We're actually an energetic being and that every uh, system of our body relies on energy. And so we want to increase that energy. Um, but there is a whole school of thought, of course, still that talks about reducing metabolism i saw you know i'm sure you're aware of brian johnson and i saw a, a post of his recently where he was boasting that his uh his core temperature was 35.5 or something like that uh sorry i don't know what that is in fahrenheit 95 maybe something like that uh 94 maybe even like that was a really a good thing so could you address that a little bit the idea that uh slowing your metabolism down is a good thing because going back to you know i know we started with omega freeze but you, i think that's kind of related right omega freeze are going to slow down metabolism as well as suppress the immune system yeah and they fit right in this conversation and so does hormesis as well right i think his protocol is a really good example of what happens when we take the reductionism of how most hormesis research is done and then turn that into a protocol right and you end up using something like resveratrol which failed miserably hundreds of millions of dollars later in terms of research when it was supposed to activate these pathways that extend lifespan. And anyway, so when it comes to the the fundamental question here, as you said, there's this view of the body as, the mach as a machine that wears out with more use. And that's basically called the rate of living theory. And part of it is based out of that thought process. It's also based on the, the 
uh, fact that has been identified, the observation that animals that have a higher metabolic rate tend to have much shorter lifespans, right? If, relative to their body size, right? So if we think about a mouse, which has a very high metabolism relative to its body size, it doesn't live very long compared to something like an elephant or us, of course, or apes or anything like that. So they then said, it's just the high metabolism. It leads to that machine wearing out faster and it dies sooner. And then we look at the caloric restriction research, which is so heavily flawed, and we come to the same conclusion. And that's called the rate of living theory. And it's missing some really important components. For one, it's not really in favor anymore scientifically. There are other theories I'll get to in a moment that are much more accurate representations of what's going on. But also it's forgetting the fact that as a sophisticated organism, we're able to regenerate, right? So your car can't fix its own engine or fix its own tires or you know whatever other issues there are, regardless of how much fuel you give it. And that's not the case for us, right? When we have an injury, we can repair it pretty dramatically and we're constantly renewing and repairing all the different cells in our body. And that is energy dependent. So it is not something where less energy just leads to less utilization. It also leads to less regeneration. And so on the flip side, if we're producing energy effectively and we have a lot of ATP available, we can function more efficiently with less damage and we can regenerate that da the damaged uh, tissues much more, much more effectively. And that brings us to some much more accurate views of what drives aging, which are things like the oxidative stress free radical theory of aging and the membrane pacemaker theory of aging, which essentially say that a couple of things. One, basically the more damage we're causing, the worse off we are. And that's the main thing that correlates with lifespan and aging. And when we look at something like a mouse, it has a high metabolic rate, but that's not because it is really efficiently producing ATP. It's kind of like we said earlier, looking at low carb versus high carb it is producing ATP very inefficiently. And so it's producing a lot of reactive oxygen species for every ATP it produces, much more relative to us. And that makes it so that every time it's trying to produce energy, it has this extra cost associated with it. It has to use more fuel to get the same amount of energy, and it creates more damage to get the same amount of energy. And that's what causes the shorter lifespan and the faster aging. One of the main determinants of that is the amount of polyunsaturated fats and how unsaturated they are inside the fats in all of our cells. So all of our mitochondria are built with mostly fat. You know, they have these phospholipid layers and those are composed of different amounts of saturated and unsaturated fats. And basically the number one determinant or thing that associates with lifespan and aging is how unsaturated those membranes are. The more unsaturated they are, the less efficiently we produce energy because of electron or sorry, proton leakage through the membrane and also sodium, potassium, leakage, which both of those reduce the efficiency of energy production and the increased susceptibility to damage and oxidation. Those few things together basically lead to a state where the more unsaturated our membranes are, the faster we age and shorter we live across all species. When we then, And that's because each species has a relatively standard amount of the amount of unsaturation in its membranes. Within a species, if we just look at mice, just look at a, you know, not apes, chimps, or just look at us, or just look at you know, a particular uh, species of animal, the ones with the higher metabolic rates actually live longer, have less reactive oxygen species, and have less unsaturated membranes. And that's because within our kind of set point, we can vary. And so if we eat a low PUFA diet and improve our efficiency of respiration, and this includes omega-3s as well, the DHA component is actually the one of the worst ones when it comes to uh, increasing unsaturation of the membrane and causing inefficiency here. When we eat much less PUFA, we improve the efficiency of our respiration, we reduce the reactive oxygen species production, we increase the efficiency with which we create ATP, the same fuel coming in, and that is the number one determinant of lifespan and aging, both looking across species and then within species. So it's basically the exact opposite of what we were told based on the rate of living theory. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a really good summation. And I know you have uh, several videos on Amiga Freeze as well. Again, I would recommend people watch if they want to go into more detail about it. Uh, one last question, if that's okay. Um, this is one of the other things, again, that I think that bioenergetics teaches, which is quite counter to most of what I've come across and what's mainstream. And there's actually the uh, the thing about calcium. So, you know, back when I was first getting to health about 15 years ago, there was a big thing, uh, movement at the time about how calcium was bad, um, how it uh, contained nanobacteria and the thing that you really wanted was magnesium. And at the time, calciums were the number one selling mineral supplements. 
And I was a big fan of magnesium back then. I'm sure you are too. You know, uh, everyone needs magnesium these days, it seems. But, uh, and so since then, you know, magnesium has become the biggest selling supplement over calcium, sorry, mineral supplement, I've noticed. Calcium, I think, is less commonly used as a supplement. It's still used by old people who listen to medical doctors, but I think there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot fewer people in the, uh, you know, kind of natural health world who consider calcium as an important nutrient, that so much so that they might need to supplement it. When I came across Ray Pete's work, I was very interested to see that he doesn't necessarily recommend calcium supplements, but he does recommend having a lot of calcium from diet, right? And the, the reason for that I'd like you to explain, because uh, I imagine you agree, and I know you do, actually. I've seen your video on it. Um, but what I wanted to talk about, because we had a doctor on just a few episodes ago who was talking about how bad calcium is and how it leads to calcification of the tissues and how you want to restrict the uh, intake of calcium s as much as possible uh, and also restrict vitamin D3 because you do, because obviously D3 increases the absorption and intake of calcium um, and because it pulls it into the tissues, right? And so <laughs> the biogenetic approach is the opposite of that. It's increasing the D3 and increasing the calcium. And I believe it's to do with the effect it has on the power of thyroid hormone, stuff like that. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you explain why a very high calcium compared to, I guess, what most people are doing and uh, a high D3 approach doesn't lead to calcification of tissues from a biogenesis point of view? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And kind of like we were talking earlier with the immune system, we want to be careful of drawing correlation versus causation, right? So in calcification, of course, calcium is involved. So are things like collagen, right? When we're talking about fibrosis and calcification, we're laying down extra layers of collagen. That doesn't mean that consuming collagen or consuming amino acids that are contributing to collagen like glycine are going or vitamin C, which contributes as well, it doesn't mean those things are going to cause fibrosis or cause calcification, right? The, just because we have a certain nutrient or, or component involved in something like we talked earlier with the immune system doesn't mean that that is the cause in the same way that if we got really sick, we don't blame the fact that we have an immune system for that illness, even though it's involved, right? If we didn't have an immune system, it would be even worse. So we want to be careful drawing those kinds of extrapolations. And I think that's largely what happened when we saw this correlation between that people were drawing between using calcium and calcification. And there's a couple of really important things to mention here. So for one, the driver of calcification in general is going to be an inflamed, basically low energy cell that is under stress. When that happens, it causes a signaling cascade that causes the release of calcium not from the calcium we've taken in, but from inside the cell in the endoplasmic reticulum that causes this flood of calcium. And stress hormones will do this. They'll interact with the cell and cause that release, among other things. And it's basically, this is a stressed out cell that's not working well. And the calcium acts as something that excites the cell, right? It, it tries to help it deal with the stress that's at hand. It increase the respiration, you know, a number of other things via stress. This isn't something good. We don't want to favor this. It's just kind of the process that happens. And if that continues and we're not able to effectively deal with the stress that's at hand, we can then end up with calcification in terms of those cells and, and then tissues. And that's not good, but it's not caused by the calcium that we're consuming or not consuming necessarily, right? This is caused by energy issues, inflammation issues that are happening inside. When we don't consume calcium, we still have a strong need for calcium, right? It's made up of you know all of our bones, contain calcium, our teeth, you know, a ton of different, different, a ton of different tissues require calcium. It's a necessary nutrient. And as a result, if we don't consume the calcium, we still have, well, we have really important adaptive systems to deal with that in the same way that if we don't have glucose, we release glucose, uh, through gluconeogenesis, we will even break down our own muscle, convert those amino acids to glucose. It's extremely important. And the same thing happens with calcium, but it, except in this case, we have to get that calcium from somewhere and we actually get it from the bones. So when we don't have very much calcium coming in, it increases the parathyroid hormone, which then causes the release of calcium from our bones so that we can maintain our calcium levels for this necessary nutrient. That's a situation where, A, we're actually reducing the amount of calcium we have in the places we want it, right? We want calcium in our bones. And we're incurring a stress process through parathyroid hormone, which goes along with other stressful processes and increases other things like serotonin and estrogen 
and can actually end up in an indirect way contributing to calcification. Much like we see with sodium and aldosterone and blood pressure, right? If we reduce our sodium intake, sodium is really necessary and our blood volume is really necessary. So we reduce our sodium intake, it decreases our blood volume because it holds water in the bloodstream. Our body says, well, we need to have blood. It increases the release of aldosterone to cause us to retain sodium so that we can maintain our blood volume. At the same time, it causes the excretion of potassium and magnesium, which of course are really important. And the aldosterone itself actually contributes to swelling, uh, impairs energy production, and actually then causes high blood pressure in an indirect way, semi-direct. And we see a very similar thing here with parathyroid hormone. So it's one of those things where we want to be careful drawing correlation and causation just because calcium is involved in calcification doesn't mean it's causing it. And in this case, we actually have the opposite where low calcium intake, increasing parathyroid hormone, and a lack of vitamin D doing the same is actually going to cause calcium dysregulation, cause a lack of calcium, effective calcium metabolism and increase the likelihood of something like calcification. Now, we do want to make sure we're getting other cofactors here that are involved in calcium metabolism. Again, this involves vitamin D, magnesium, and vitamin K2. All four of those are important, and a lack of any of those can contribute to high parathyroid hormone. And so if we increase one without the others, we can have issues, whether it's increasing vitamin D without those other ones or increasing calcium without those other ones. So it's important to consider that whole spectrum. But avoiding calcium, I would say, is definitely not the solution. Yeah, and you can't avoid it completely. But, you know, I realized uh, a couple of years ago, actually when I had the lead diagnosis, that my uh, calcium intake for years had been about 200 milligrams a day and the recommended daily intake was like 1,000 milligrams a day. And I think Pete's recommendation is more even like 2,000 milligrams a day. So I had been on a very calcium poor diet for a long time. And I think that is something that I discovered that if you are ingesting lead, which I must have been at some point, that it increases the absorption of lead, uh, the the less calcium that you have in your diet. So that's yet another <laughs> more niche but good reason to make sure that you're having enough calcium. Uh, Peter's also very concerned about the ratio of calcium to phosphorus, right? What's your uh, take on that? Yeah, and they basically antagonize each other to an extent. And so excess, cal or excess phosphorus is basically the same as low calcium. It'll increase parathyroid hormone. And so we can consider them in ratio and try to get at least, I would say ideally we're looking at a one-to-one -one ratio or more of calcium to phosphorus. In a lot of the studies, as long as it's at least one to two calcium to phosphorus, we're okay in terms of parathyroid hormone release, but I would say ideal is going to be one-to-one -one or even higher. But they show very clearly that once you go below one to two, where your phosphorus is double or more your calcium, you begin to see increases in, in parathyroid hormone. So it's the other side of that equation that we want to be uh, very aware of. And I wasn't aware of that in terms of lead absorption. So that's definitely interesting, but I am aware of it in terms of uh, oxalate absorption and metabolism. And so there's a lot of people dealing with oxalate issues. There's a number of reasons for that, a number of metabolic processes involved, as opposed to it just being any amount of oxalates is this major issue. We need to avoid them at all costs. And calcium is one of those. Increasing calcium will actually help to help us deal with, with uh, oxalates. So. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's interesting about the calcium to phosphorus thing because I think most people trying to do healthy diets these days are actually going to have a high level of phosphorus to calcium, right? Whether it's a paleo diet or a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet or, I don't know, even a, even a vegan fruitarian diet, I guess, to some degree because all of these are extremely low in calcium. Like really the main source of calcium is dairy, right? And if you're cutting out dairy as most people do when they're trying to be healthy – it's quite tricky to get high calcium, especially if you're also having high phosphorus. I'm thinking like, uh, you know, vegans eat a lot of nuts and seeds, which is high in phosphorus. You know, paleo carnival people are having a lot of uh, uh, animal uh, muscle, which is high in phosphorus. So what? What? Uh, let's say if someone doesn't tolerate dairy, where do you recommend that they get their calcium from? Yeah, so you can uh, get it from some cooked leafy greens. That is, you know, if we're tolerating those well, that is an option for calcium intake. Uh, we also might want to try different types of dairy. You know, maybe we don't do well with milk, but we can do, you know, an A2 or goat cheese or something like that to, to get our calcium. Some people like to use eggshell calcium as a supplement where you basically cook the eggshells and then grind them up into a powder. You could try that. Personally, I prefer coral calcium as far as supplements go. And, uh, I think that's typically a little bit better digested compared to the eggshell, which I've seen just cause some irritation for some people. But yeah, I do think if we're not going to be able to get it from dairy and we're not going to be able to get it from Coach Leafy Greens, then it is worth supplementing until, until we can get to a point where we can actually bring dairy back in, which for the vast majority of people, I think that is possible. I don't think 
this is one of those things where dairy is, is kind of evil and contributes to all these disease processes, but rather when we have a really heightened immune system that's induced by stress, like a hyperactive immune system, it tends to react to a lot of things and that can include the reaction to proteins in dairy, but we can improve that over time. And then also the digestion of the lactose, we kind of alluded to this earlier, it's a really common issue, but we can restore that if we have a good healthy microbiome, good digestion, and good thyroid status. Those things will all help us produce adequate lactase so that we can break down the lactose. And normally those are the main issues with dairy. So if those things are covered, I think most people can bring it back in and, and ideally we can get to a point where that can happen so we can get those benefits of dairy like calcium and vitamin K2 and some good protein and things like that. Excellent. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of uh, you know sheep and uh, goat dairy personally, but I know there's a lot of people who uh, do have an issue with them. Well, uh, I guess, you know, this talk of food leads us to, you know, one of the things that you really specialize in. So um, I know you, you had a, a free guide for people about the uh, the best foods, like how to select the best foods to eat for them, which uh, I went through. I can't remember the name of it. You can remind me. Um, but, yeah, it, it breaks it down into, you know, different categories like optimal and you know, potentially beneficial, but, you know, possibly uh, um, not a good idea if you're first starting, if you're still struggling. So I liked it. It was like a really helpful, practical guide to help people kind of navigate this world. If you like what Jay is saying and you'd like to try this approach to eating and healing your body, then it's a really good starting place. Uh, where where uh, can people get that from, Jay? Yeah, thanks for, for mentioning that. That's called the Energy Balance Food Guide. And listeners can find that at jfeldmanwellness.com slash guide. As you were saying, we talked about a lot of what not to do, and the guide helps to tell us both what we should do and what we don't want to do in terms of the foods coming in, kind of ranks things on a spectrum in terms of how they support us or don't support us metabolically and digestively as well. So it's a really great starting place as far as uh, starting to implement some of the principles we discussed in terms of diet. Excellent. And I haven't been through your program. Could you tell us in a nutshell what that does for people? Yeah, yeah. So I, I have a course called the Energy Balance Course, which if you like the food guide and are really wanting to apply everything we talked about to other aspects of your lifestyle, you know, creating a really healthy diet, but also addressing sleep and stress and uh, movement and supplements and doing everything we need to do to get our health in the right place. Uh, I have a course called the Energy Balance Course, which is designed to help people do exactly that. And then I kind of have a more advanced program called the Energy Balance Solution, which is a group coaching program and includes more advanced techniques and strategies. We talk through blood tests and hormones and some of the supplements we mentioned today. And so that might be a good place as a second step. And you also get a free month of, of access to that when you join the Energy Balance course. So you'll have all the tools you need. Nice. And you do also work with people one-on-one, -on -one, right? You do one-on-one -on -one coaching of people. Yes, I do. Yeah. And all that information is available at my website, jfeldmanwellness.com. Excellent. Uh, and what are your social handles? It is JF Wellness. I think in most, you know, on Instagram and uh, most places, I'm mostly active with my podcast, uh, which is called the Energy Balance Podcast. And it's also available on uh, YouTube if you search for the Energy Balance Podcast or JF Feldman Wellness. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to share with us today. I've really enjoyed it. I've uh, learned a lot. Um, I'm a little bit clearer now on the bioenergetic approach to, uh, you know, some of these key issues, which is exactly what I was looking for. So uh, I hope people watching feel the same. I definitely recommend you check out more of Jay's work. He has created a kind of encyc encyclopedic resource of answers to all kinds of uh, questions and issues on his YouTube channel. I think you literally have hundreds of hours of content of that you're, you know, freely giving away. So. Whatever topic you're interested in, whether you're interested in losing weight, whether you're interested in this supplement, whether you're interested in, uh, you know, this hormone or whatever it might be, Jay probably either has a video or a series of videos that covers it, which is really cool. So I definitely recommend that uh, you check that out. That's 100% free. Um, and, you know, I can tell how much you care because, you know, you put a lot of uh, effort into that. I can, you, do, you know, you do a lot of research for those episodes, I believe. And, um, uh, yeah, they're very good. So... Uh, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for being on this podcast and uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate all the kind words and yeah, I'd love to come back on again. Hey, what did you think of that? <laughs> As I said I, at the beginning, I really enjoyed this episode. Um, the one thing I was going to add that I kind of alluded to in the intro that I thought was interesting about Jay is I think out of everyone who I've interviewed and possibly even met in the health world, he seemed like the most relaxed of all of them, not just 
during while we were filming the interview, but also before and afterwards. Now, again, he may just be that way genetically. I'm not 100% sure. But I thought it's interesting that his philosophy, um, as he talked about, was like questioning the very concept of hormesis, which is such an absolute staple, not just of the kind of mainstream health scientific world, but even most of the alternative health world, right? They talk about different forms of hormesis. And so I thought it's interesting that <laughs> probably the most relaxed health teacher I've ever uh, come across, or at least who appears that way, obviously I don't know him very well in his everyday life, um, would be teaching this philosophy of questioning if really any kind of stress is necessarily um, you know, beneficial to the organism or not. And I don't think, you know, he was saying that all stress is bad, but just questioning, you know, whether stress is good is more how I took it. But anyway, so very much enjoyed that. I do recommend you check out more of his work. Uh, we've got a bunch of links below where there's kind of further information on a lot of the topics that we covered with him today. So check that out in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, remember, please subscribe, click the bell icon to make sure that you're notified every time leave a comment ideally if you're a fan of this show and you probably are if you're still watching to the end like leave a comment every episode if you're watching on youtube please it really really helps you know hit that like button and if you're listening on apple or spotify or whatever please review us if you haven't already that really helps us uh, uh with the algorithm and all that kind of stuff and you know just helps other people as well know that we're something worth listening to and also uh, all of that stuff is of course free but if you are so inclined, you'd like to support us further and also uh, get some really potentially life-changing information that can really help you, check out geneticinsights.co and also for all your supplement needs, check out feelyounger.net. Uh, thank you so much and I'll see you for the next episode. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above and make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.